have a special guest today who has hiked the Arctic Circle Trail in the summer and just finished skiing it in the winter. Oh. So why don't you introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about kind of how you came to doing these long distance tracks and in remote places. Okay, so I'm uh, Ernst Rietzel from Belgium, uh, father of one son of 17. Uh, I hiked the Arctic Circle Trail with him last year in summer, in August. I thought it was brilliant. Um, and since I've done Arctic hikes, but long ago in the past, before my son was born in Nunavut, uh, between mm -hmm. Pangmirtung and Rikik Tajwak, and I thought it was an amazing trail to do, uh, also in early spring, I immediately thought, well, I want to do this again now in winter. Uh, and so during the trail, I was already hatching the plan. And basically, I've been planning to do this um, since I arrived after the trail. And so I'm very happy to have done it. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great experience. Um, yeah, fantastic trail. Okay, so you've done some very long distance hikes, winter hikes in uh, Nunavut area as well. Yeah, but that was in, uh, there I was not alone, it was mm. with my ex-wife. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was the first one, a really long hike that I did completely on my own. Okay. So it, it is a different experience to do it on, on your own. I would love to do it with my son, but that was logistically not possible because yep. he was in school. And still I felt, well, I would be happy if he joins me next year and says, well, I'm 18, um, mm. joining you and you've already reconnoitered the path. But this one on my own, uh, I thought, well, it's just for safety reasons, um, I'll do it like this. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And how did you decide on the Arctic Circle Trail, both in the in the summer and in the, well, and then from the winter, it came from the summer. Yeah. But. Um, I, I prefer cold and I've uh. always had this fascination with the Arctic. Uh, and my son as well. So when we started hiking three years ago, uh, we first went to Iceland, did the Lagavigur Trail, uh, did Hornstrandir, which he preferred mm -hmm. because it was much more remote, uh, not a lot of people. Then the year after that, we went back to Hornstrandir alone, did a much longer hike. And then the Arctic Circle Trail more or less immediately fell into the scope where we have this, uh, one of those classic iconic tracks. Um, I mean, it's it's, awe-inspiring it's, it's 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 like a mythical track especially if you're 17 you think of oh, this is a great thing to do uh, and so that that immediately came into focus and that uh, we started preparing for that hmm. okay so with your with your winter hike mm -hmm. let's go with that one first wait what what date did you start so you've only arrived in Sisimir a few days ago so I think I started the 18th of March okay and how long did you take to do it I took 10 days yep. I took it slowly uh, mm -hmm. I had food for 13 plus days so I did not really have a schedule um, and there was no there was no time pressure for me. I mean, it, it's it's about enjoying the hike. Mm. So it's basically uh, I I had lunch at the side of my pulka uh, where I rolled down my reindeer skin, uh, had a warm soup, uh, sometimes fell asleep, mm. uh, had a little nap and just enjoyed the land and the landscape if the weather was good, of course. Mm. Um, so there was no time pressure. So that uh, that's the reason I took 10 days and I'm happy that I did it. OK. Yeah. And were you on skis or on snowshoes or? I was simply on shoes with, with micro spikes. Yeah, okay. I had snowshoes uh, I, at home and at the la very last minute I thought, well, the snow cover doesn't look that thick. Yeah. And I mean, it's cumbersome, it weighs a lot. And I thought, I'll just leave them at home uh, and, and I'll hope I'll manage with the micro spikes. And for 99% of the trail, it was perfect to do. Mm. Uh, the only moment that I needed the snowshoes when was when I, uh, I lost the snowmobile tracks in the mist. Yep. And then I, uh, f instead of backtracking and finding the snowmobile tracks again, which I should have done, I kind of thought, well, okay, it should be this way and followed my, my GPX trail, which I had prepared beforehand uh, and ended up in deep snow and a boulder field. So the only mm. moment that I um, wandered away from local wisdom of this is the track was the moment where I found myself into deep snow uh, and arduous terrain. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so you mentioned you were dragging a pulka. Yeah. Uh, roughly, how much did it weigh in the end? Uh, in the end, I don't know, but I think I started out at 50, 55 kilos. Yeah, okay. So I started out with really heavy pulka. Yeah. Um, I did not need more than half of what was in the pulka. Uh -huh. um, but I'm, I'm kind of risk averse, which is yeah. kind of strange in saying, because uh, if you're going to do this solo, you're kind of seeking well, there is a risk element to it, mm. uh, but then the risk averse part is really preparing for all contingencies. Mm. And so having a lot of stuff, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I had double poles, I had a complete set of stakes to cover multiple uh, situations of snow and hard ground. Um, 
clothing which was far too thick for uh, if a new ice age were to come down. Um, <laughs> you would have been set. <laughs> yeah, uh, medical equipment to uh, kind of save half a community in case of a medical emergency. <laughs> uh, just plan for an Ebola outbreak, you never know. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, but in the end, I, I needed some of it. Huh? My carrying system mm. got broken, my uh, rigid carrying system of ah. my pulka got broken. And having the material to fix it with, with cords was necessary. So, I mean, you, you have to prepare for those eventualities because you don't want to, uh, well, first of all, you want to get out safety and you don't want to overburden local communities, which mm. are there doing their thing and they're not there to uh, assist uh, lonely hikers who do stupid things. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Because you had uh, a whole series of YouTube videos that you created uh, yeah. beforehand where you went through with great uh, detail exactly what you were packing and why you were thinking it and all the rest of it. So in the end, um, I mean, you might do another video as well when you get home about what what was necessary, what wasn't necessary, what you do differently next time. But just a bit of a summary. What did you pack that you were very, very glad you packed? And what did you pack that you, in hindsight, even if the conditions were slightly worse, you sort of thought, well, I could have actually done without that. Okay. Um, well, first of all, the videos were there more as a... Uh, as a testing ground, as mm. in this, these are my preparation and let's see if I, I found significant criticisms by other people mm -hmm. which would point me towards flaws in my thinking or flaws into my preparation, which mm. luckily was not the case. What I absolutely loved taking along were the reindeer skins. Mm. I had two reindeer skins which I cut up to size so that together they form the mattress. Mm -hmm. They are brilliant for warmth, they are brilliant for versatility. I mean, you just stop somewhere, you take them out, you roll them out. You lie in the snow, uh, I mean, they isolate brilliantly. Um, so these I would absolutely take again. Mm -hmm. um, and then stuff I would not take again. Uh, far too many undergarments. Mm. I had multiple layers of undergarments and I don't know why, but you kind of finish the entire trail with more or less one or two undergarments that you carry. And the clean ones are just clean and you carry them along and um, it is inconceivable before you leave the trail, but on, on the trail it's kind of perfectly logical. I mean, it doesn't smell yet, it's still warm, it hasn't got damp, there's no reason to change a winning team. And so I had <laughs> far too many socks and undergarments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. And so with, with food, so you said you took enough food for 13 days, I think yeah. you said. So did you have like a calorie? Uh, ceiling that you were planning on hitting each day and was, yeah. was that necessary or? Well, I had a calorie ceiling of around two and a half thousand calories, which mm -hmm. is far too little. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I had freeze dried food, breakfast in the morning, uh, dinner in the evening, and then a usually a, a warm soup or an extra meal at midday. Uh, I bought a, a lot of condensed milk with me, the sugary mm. condensed milk, mm -hmm. kind of these an old fashioned taste harking back to a- Childhood? The, yeah, to childhood. <laughs> And so I had a, a really nutritious cup of coffee in the morning yeah. um, and some beef jerky that my partner gave, uh, gave as well. Um, and so that was, that was great. And the other thing that I took with me was almost half a liter of Tabasco sauce. Holy I, moly, okay. I <laughs> absolutely adore Tabasco sauce. And I, um, I must say that I, I just barely managed um, to portion it out so that I still had enough at the end. <laughs> And so, uh, except for the breakfast part, I'm not a weirdo, but except for the breakfast part, uh, lunch and dinner were heavily spiced with Tabasco sauce. And I, I will even admit, um, and my son knows this, that just on the track, I would sometimes nip at a bottle of Tabasco sauce. And you, how do you have this? I miss the, the trail food is great, mm. yeah, but there is a certain lack of acidity. Okay, yep. uh, the, the yep. fr the yeah. The freshness and the acidity, that's why you, you long for fruit and vegetables when yep. you get into the real world. And this freshness and this acidity is there in Tabasco oh, because it's quite it's quite acid. Yeah, it is. And, yeah. and I, I love acid things, so that's that's one of the things that I really miss, and that for me is really essential to make it palatable. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I've never thought of Tabasco sauce before. Because yeah, I I agree. The trekking meals which I take as yeah. well, yeah, they're okay, but they just lack spice because everything I cook is spicy. So yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, so you did it by yourself. Yes. Uh, which is amazing. And then what was the actual weather conditions like? Um, so I will preface it by saying that for us locals, this year is very, very warm yep. for this time of year. But how did how did you find it? Like temperature, wind, that kind of thing? Okay, I, I had beautiful weather conditions. I actually hoped for worse weather conditions. <laughs> I was 
kind of pining for a good Arctic storm, but uh, yeah. also happy that it wasn't there. So weather conditions, I think during the daytime were something between minus six and minus 10, mm. and at night was something between minus 15 and minus 24, something like that. Um, practically wind still for mm. most of the hike. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was really easy. Mm. Yeah, that was really, really easy. And the snow conditions? Uh, the snow conditions were great, except that um, putting the 10 stakes in was quite difficult because uh. you have this, the top layer of 10 centimeters of snow, which isn't really snow. I mean, it's this um, granular ice, mm. which crumbles apart and you can't mold it into any shape. You can't make a snowball out of it. You can't use it to pin down your tent pegs. Mm -hmm. And then below that, you've got, yeah, you've got frozen ground or ice. Yeah. And so snow stakes were pretty much useless because the, this granular ice has no holding power. You, yes, you can put them in and hope that it, it freezes a little bit overnight and that's great and it works if there's a very little wind, mm -hmm. but it's not something which will protect you when there's truly a lot of wind. So what worked was actually, um, I camped on the lakes. Mm -hmm. uh, I always sought out the lake. I had nice ice screws mm -hmm. and I just used six ice screws, scraped off the 10 centimeters of top snow. Mm -hmm. And so I had a really firm way to uh, anchor my uh, so the snow conditions on that reg regard were great to uh, to walk on mm. and great to pull the pulka um, difficult to put the snow pegs in mm. okay yeah. okay and you said I did it alone but that's not completely true eh? I yes I was alone but I saw at least somebody every day mm. I was gonna ask you how many dog sledders and snowmobilers did you see because they're mm. most likely locals yeah and then how many other hikers, skiers? Okay, kind of so no other hikers or skiers yep. yeah, at all. Um, although I must have passed the uh, the group that went Sisimut, Kanga Sluswak, Sisimut, but uh, must have missed them. Uh, and then locals, I met at least one person a day. Mm. Uh, one time a, snow, um, a dog sled team, most of them on snowmobiles. And I mean, it's great, they either all stop to just have a talk, uh, just to check over if you're okay, mm. um, and uh, or they slow down and they wait for the thumbs up and then they're gone again. Mm -hmm. um, and they they kind of I, I I slept in my tent. I didn't sleep in the huts mm. except for one or two occasions. Yep. Um, and I sometimes had my tent quite close to the huts. Yeah. And uh, they, they would sometimes stop and say, well, the hut is only a, a few kilometers further away, but then just explain that I preferred sleeping in my tent. Mm. Um, and this was good enough for me, so that was uh, that was interesting. So they were uh, incredibly kind. I've uh, already had a dinner uh, with one of the people I met on the trail That's awesome. uh, on the second night, and his fiance from uh, um, uh, from Denmark. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two local police officers here. Yep. Um, and there's still another man, the the one that um, uh, took me away after being pestered by the Arctic fox. That mm. uh, I'm going to see either this night or tomorrow night. Mm. Yeah, that, yeah no, they, are, they are very, very friendly to locals. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and they understand that, you know, it is important to make sure that if you find somebody, especially somebody by themselves out in the, the back country, yeah. that you check. Yeah. Even if it's all fine all the time, you still check. And I'm, and they do that for them, for themselves also. Mm. I mean, it, it is kind of an unwritten mm -hmm. logical law of being out in very harsh circumstances mm -hmm. that there is an element of potential danger and so you take care of each other yeah and that's very very palpable and reassuring so it's one of the one of the places where you can be truly isolated in the wilderness mm. but still have human contact pretty much every day mm. and a possibility to to make it known if there's a problem yeah yeah so you said that you encountered a, uh, a polar fox or yeah. an arctic fox which unfortunately had rabies well i guess yeah, yeah i mean it definitely sounds like that yeah. so can you just tell us a, just a little bit about that experience and what you did to to try to protect yourself i i just had put up my tent um and i saw a polar fox coming towards me now I, i've seen a lot of polar foxes in the past in hornstrand here it's it's the home of the polar foxes i mean mm -hmm. they are like 20 playing around your tent uh, but this one was weird in its behavior in that it was a big white fox. Mm. It came running straight at me and, and kind of jumped at my throat. And then I, since I was putting up my tent, I, I whacked it away with my snow shovel. Um, but it immediately came back and tried again for a second time, which is mm. certainly not playful or curious uh, Arctic fox behavior. No. Uh, and so I chased it away once um, and I was pretty happy with that, although a little bit concerned because it might come back. 
and I just was sitting in my tent, taking out my, taking off my outer shoes, and then I felt my tent moving because he was trying to bite through the oh, the wow. guidelines of my tent, and yeah. so I when I went out, it um, it attacked me again, and so it it kind of. Um, it was incredibly clever. I would be at one side of the tent, it would be at the other side, it would bite in my tent until I would say, okay, this is enough, you're ruining my tent, this is not <laughs> funny, I need to chase you away. And once I started moving into the deep snow, it would kind of go around the other side of my tent and then try to attack me at the back. And so, wow. and it, that lasted for around 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I probably could have ended it by, it was obvious that it had rabies yeah. uh, by its behavior. I could have ended it by letting it get closer and then you know, try to kill it, but that's not something I uh, would do in, mm. in usual life. And I was very lucky that a local man, Tuma, uh, passed by. Um, the, the fox fled away at that moment and he was uh, very nice and dropped me off at the lake house. Mm. And so I spent the night at the lake house. Yeah. 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 Uh, and in the meantime, I've heard that two hunters mm. have killed it yeah. um, because of its behavior. And it's been sent for analysis for confirmation that it has or has not rabies. But by its behavior, I mean, it certainly was not a normal polar fox. Yeah, yeah. So I think last summer as well, there was a, a couple of reports of, of a polar fox and also yeah. one earlier this winter. So Yes, and ex at exactly the same site where I got yeah. attacked. Yeah. So that was, uh, and what that, that report was, I think, about a week before I left. Mm, okay. So yep. I mean, it's very likely the same Arctic fox. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. The the thing is, is that, you know, again, another thing to be prepared for. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely. very, 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 very unlikely to come across a polar bear. But there are polar foxes, and unfortunately, some of them, not not a huge number, but yeah. there are some with rabies. So, yeah. very glad. I got vaccinated before I left. Mm. Uh, I already That's had been idea. vaccinated in the past, but I had booster vaccinations. Yeah. Just to be safe. Um, and so, yeah, okay, I mean, it, it was a um, it was a story to tell. And at the moment itself, it's it's um, it's kind of scary. Uh, but yeah. it's, I mean, in the end, nothing, it wouldn't have killed me. Huh? Well, no, but it would have done some uh, serious health issues. Even even with vaccination, it's still not a, a, a yeah, good thing Yeah, but you need another eat. couple of shots of vaccination. Exactly. And, and it probably would have curtailed your, just your, your trip just to get the vaccination sooner. Exactly. But I mean, well, you would have had to have been airlifted out, I think, at that point. To get to, I can't remember the exact timing, but in order to get to the next shot, it has to be fairly fast after yeah. you've been, yeah. after you've been bitten, so... So I'm very glad that uh, you managed <laughs> so, to avoid the whole thing, so and I'm very glad that they've taken that you know, it is actually, unfortunately, killed. Um, but at least, hopefully, that means that it's a bit safer for everybody. Yeah, on and, the trail. and also for the locals. I mean, it's it's a yeah. danger for the dogs. It is the, yeah. for the dog team. I think that's one of the, the real hazards. Yeah, and also, of course, for the all, uh, other animals as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, okay. Um, what else was going to ask? I was going to ask. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so I'm really curious because you've done it in summer and you've done it in winter. Yeah. Which do you prefer? I... Or well, I'm sure both are spectacular, <laughs> of course. Both, both are completely different. You can't yeah. compare them. I mean, in summer okay. you, you have a, a backpack. Yep. Uh, you are more limited in your weight because mm. adding extra days of food to your backpack is already stretching it. Mm. Uh, I mean, that, that's one of the things. Uh, in winter, you are far more liberal in your weight because a pulka mm. is is far easier. Uh, but I do absolutely prefer it in the winter. Mm. Uh, I thought it's great to have this this white, rough, wild landscape. Um, the cold nights in the tent, the mornings melting snow when you're sitting in your sleeping bag, and you have your kettle boiling with your tent flap open so that you can look on this glistening horizon with wow. the, the snow coming up uh, and with the steam rising over uh, over the kettle when you're melting the snow um, I, it, there is something truly glorious about it wow yeah yeah, yeah. that would be very special so, but, th but that is my personal preference for for winter and winter travel yeah yeah, yeah. so did you do any because you say you've done these long winter trips a while ago in the river but did you do any specific training before this trip uh, I planned to do some I uh, I went to the gym for the first time in my life mm. uh, and I, I, th I think I went six times but with my uh, also with my work I mean it's not easy to combine um, so it's um, I mean it, it went in summer as well without any training mm. and I huff and I puff the first few days mm. and then it goes and I, I think my, my main training was that 
I gave myself time with the amount of food that I have mm -hmm. and the amount of time that I could take so that if there was an off day or if I was slow, I was slow mm. or I had an off day, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that was the biggest training I took. Yeah. 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 Fair um, enough. Being fitter would certainly help. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure whether skis would be faster. I'm, I'm quite sure that would be, but yeah. I'm not a proficient skier, at least in cross country skiing. Yeah. Uh, although I'm, I'm th seriously thinking, uh, sorry mom and dad, of doing it again with skis, <laughs> uh, but that might be a plan for the future. Yeah, you know? maybe with your son. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be great. Cool. Yeah. So what was? Uh, so you mentioned like the the you painted us the picture of being in your tent with the kettle on and all the rest of it. But what what was the other highlight of your trip? I think the beauty of the Nerumak Valley. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, I the the. Crossing the lakes, there is a, a beautiful serenity, the landscape, but I mean the, um, the changing vistas on the Nirumak Valley, where you have truly these corners that you cross and you are in another part of the Nirumak Valley, um, it, it is something quite spectacular. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, for me, it's, it's one big highlight. The Nirumak Valley is certainly one big highlight, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Did you come across, apart from your polar fox, many other animals on the trail or not so many? Um, yeah, I saw a few reindeer, uh, a few uh, not afflicted polar foxes. Mm -hmm. um, heard a lot of ptarmigans, mm -hmm. but saw very few. I mean, they are incredibly tricky. Yeah. They are incredibly difficult to spot. I, I was uh, incredibly impressed when I saw local hunters uh, hearing them make a little squeak and then shooting them. Yeah. And seriously, when I was in my tent, they were squeaking left, right, behind and in front of me. Yeah. They were very close, but I, I really found it troubling to see them. Yeah. So I, I saw a few because they were oh, silhouetted oh. Um, and not hidden by the snow. Yeah. So then I could easily see them, mm -hmm. but they were difficult to see. But you hear them everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, e even in the summer, they're very, very hard to spot. Yeah. As well. they, once they start flapping around in the bushes, then yeah. you can spot them, but not before that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Usually the only time I've seen them in the summer is when uh, they're on the trail in front of you and you have no idea that they're there, yeah. but they see you and then suddenly there's this flurry of motion along the trail in front of you. They think, oh, oh crap, there's a bird there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is a, I think the other highlight is simply at certain moments taking the time to stop and just admire the landscape. I mean, the, the great thing about the pulka is that you, you just stop, you sit on your pulka or you roll down um, your reindeer your, skin. Your reindeer yeah. skin and you just admire the landscape for a few minutes uh, yeah. and then just s stop walking and just let it sink in and i, I took time to do that mm -hmm. uh, i mean and it, it is such an incredible landscape yeah. Mm. yeah yeah okay and what what were the challenges um the challenges were my physical condition yeah that was one i um there were two days that i found it really hard going and that i was cursing at myself um, but those were the days when I was actually focused on well, I need to do this distance rather than just enjoying I'm on the trail and okay. it goes how it goes. Yeah. Um, I think I was also a bit preoccupied by my partner. Uh, she was going to have surgery uh, that okay. day. Yep. That and so I might not have been completely in, in the mood and uh, in the flow. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was one challenge. Um, yeah, the, the, the weight of my bulk. I mean, I take along so much stuff. My son laughs with me. Uh, during the <laughs> summer trail, we met somebody who had um, the sole of her walking boot fallen off. Ah. And um, she asked me, though, do you have either duct tape or a needle and thread? Uh, and my son said, oh, he has a, certainly has both and probably a cobbler set in there as well. And that's true. I have a plan B uh, and then I have a contingency plan yep. for plan B. And there's a fail safe for plan C as well. Oh, which wow. is, uh, and so there was... There was a lot of stuff in my pulka, but yeah. that's so. If I would do it again, I'm certain that I could lose at least 15 kilos. Yeah. Um, but then again, it was 25 years ago that I did an Arctic trail, yeah. and now I was on my own. So I mean, it, yeah, it, I gave myself the luxury of, of having that security. Yeah. And as I said, this year is very warm. Yeah. So you know, in a normal year, yeah, you you would expect an Arctic storm or something like yeah. that. So you know, and that that changes things quite yeah. significantly. And so I would have been prepared for that, and I think you. I, I wouldn't leave without being prepared for that. No. I mean, you, you plan for the absolute worst. Absolutely. 
Uh, so I had, for example, double poles for my tent, mm -hmm. which is great when you have a mass of snow falling down or a wind beating down at a, uh, a high angle. Um, and it was completely useless for the small wind that we had this year, but I'm not sure I would leave without it, or at least yeah. one extra double pole. So, I mean, it's, it's part of the game of, of um, being responsible mm. in going into these conditions. Mm. Yeah. Well, you mentioned earlier that, you know, even though everybody is very, very lovely yes. uh, as they come across you on the trail, you know, it's they're out doing their thing. Yes. They don't really want to be rescuing somebody who came ill prepared and has no, found they, themselves in difficulty. They absolutely will. And but that's will not really. No, they will be happy yeah. to do it. But you are interfering with what they're out doing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, hmm. And compared to summer. Mm hmm. So is there any, what was your highlight during the summer, perhaps, as well? Because it is quite different, yeah. From My summer highlight during the summer, we did the southern route. Yeah. So when we were, um, um, at a certain moment, we were walking the northern route, and uh, the, the southern route was looming there in the background, what should we do it or not? Yeah. And then we were, we were doing fine, so we said, okay, let's do the, the southern route. We immediately found the going a lot harder, yeah. because, I mean... The, the, there is not that trail. You are constantly yeah. walking on this mushy underground where your your feet are, are sinking into um, the vegetation. So the, the going was immediately a lot harder. Mm. Um, and navigationally. And navigationally. Um, so glad that I had binoculars with me mm. because the, the cairns, the, inu the inukshuks too. were farther away. Yep. And so um, having the possibility to, to really scope it out with a binocular and saying, okay, there is an Inukshuk there or a yeah. cairn, that's the direction to go. Um, and then simply visiting Sarfangwit. I mean, yeah. you arrive at the other end of the fjord mm -hmm. and um, yeah, you need to grab attention in some manner. So you take a hiking pole and you put your uh, um, uh, something at the end, uh, a t-shirt, <laughs> and you wave like a, a little idiot and then... <laughs> somebody will come in and, and take you and you are suddenly within this um, this great little village which hasn't had a lot of contact I think with hikers yeah um, so it's a privilege mm. um, and so we were fortunate enough to be able to stay there as well mm -hmm. um, have a good breakfast the next morning go to the shop bacon and eggs uh, nice yeah. <laughs> um, and then get, get dropped off again on the trail somewhat further down yeah uh, so that was really um, yeah, that was really a great highlight. Yeah. 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 And, and what was your biggest... my son as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's cool. Because yeah. I know that the, the people of Safangwood are very keen to, to have hikers visit them. Yeah. But um, yeah, just a caveat for this podcast at this time is that, uh, you know, as we've said, yeah, there is no trail on the southern route. The no. Cairns are... If you don't have binoculars, at least, yeah. um, you will not be able to see the oh. next cairn from where you are. And you need a map, you need a compass, and you need a GPS. Exactly. You cannot do it if you don't know how to navigate. No, it's not simply Explain. it's not simply following the trail because there is no trail. Exactly. Yeah. So you need to be prepared for that. But yeah, it is it is, does offer a different kind of experience to yeah. the regular the regular route. And I, and I don't think you can automatically expect that somebody will see you from the other side of no. the fjord in Sarfangwit, that somebody will have the energy, the, uh, the intention, the time, yeah. the motivation to come and pick you up and that um, you will find somewhere to stay. I mean, mm. it is a village which is, uh, there is no infrastructure at this moment in time uh, for dealing with, with hikers. Exactly, um, exactly. There are just nice people. Yeah. I'm glad you had such a good experience there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you got up to the Crystal Igloo as well? No, we didn't. Ah, okay. No. Okay. It's... It, 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 um, they were speaking fondly of it, yeah. But for me, it's it's something which, um, although a very beautiful thing, mm. it it is not something local. No, no. I mean, it's it's not really for me part of what Greenland mm -hmm. uh, or this part of Greenland is about, yeah. Uh, and the Arctic or Inuit. So I mean, it's it's a beautiful structure, mm -hmm. but I have far more revel in seeing how local people live. Yeah. And, and the real Greenland. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's something spectacular, mm -hmm. but it's not authentic enough yeah, fair for enough. me. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's a very personal opinion. might be controversial, but... Uh, that's, no, no. It's yeah. I mean, how you feel is how you feel, and yeah. I, I totally get the authenticity yeah. as well. So, uh, and so what, what was the biggest challenge for you in summer? The biggest challenge? Um, the walking terrain on the southern route. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, 53 now. Um, and uh, with the backpack and not having a solid foot on the ground, 
uh, I mean, it was really a lot heavier going. Yeah. 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 So I really felt that. Mm-hmm. Uh, didn't stop me enjoying it, but it was certainly something where you, you, you felt it at the end of the day that uh, yeah, your muscles were, were sore than on the northern route. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But then again, there was this beautiful challenge of having a piece that had not been walked a lot before yeah. and then, uh, I mean, it, the lure was too strong. <laughs> <laughs> You're an adventurer. Definitely an adventurer. <laughs> so just to, fi- to finish off, um, what sort of a, what advice would you give to people thinking about doing the Arctic Circle Trail in winter? Okay. Um, I think be prepared. Um, now I'm guessing if you're trying to do this in winter, you, you probably have some experience. Mm. Uh, I found that there was an incredible amount of information on uh, the Arctic Circle Facebook page. Mm. Um, if you search the archives, if you look at that, uh, what people have done and said, I mean, there I asked quite a few questions there as well, got quite a, a few very clear answers as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so do your research, yeah. um, be prepared. Um, I think that would be the, the biggest one, that b- basically take your responsibility to uh, go into this environment where you are, you leave a minimum of traces behind. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And for summer, same thing? For summer, same thing. Um, actually, for summer, maybe the, the, the strange thing is that in winter, uh, an extraction is far easier. Yeah. I mean, in winter, you have snowmobiles, snowmobiles passing yeah. by. So uh, a, a winter extraction is a piece of cake yeah. compared to a summer extraction, which yeah. is a, really a slog, Yeah. I guess. Um, well, it's a helicopter, basically. <clears throat> yeah. So it, it's, it's quite more, uh, I mean, it, it's quite more intrusive and invasive. Uh, mm. um, for summer... I probably have the same due diligence. Mm. Be prepared. Uh, make sure that you can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, talk to other people. Inform yourself. Um, yeah, just be prepared and have fun. And come with um, an open mind and um, take in all the the beauty of not only the landscape but the local culture. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So stop. Stop. And enjoy. And enjoy, yeah. yeah. Feel the land. Yeah, awesome. Great advice. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining me today. And I think it's fantastic that you've done it in both the summer and the winter. Because there's a, there's a handful of people I know who've done that. But uh, you're the first I've actually been able to talk to face-to-face. So All right. thank you very much for your time. It was my absolute pleasure.